today actually for the first time I've had when I press record on Zoom it talked back to me saying recording in progress is this a new advancement in Zoom technology anyway hello again um, I'm David Lindo also known as the um, Birda with me tonight or this afternoon depending where you are in the world is a guy that I've known for for some time his name is James Lowen and he resides in a lovely place called Norfolk and and before we even go ahead and have a conversation James let me just quickly say that tonight this afternoon has been sponsored by Leica Sport Optics so thank you very much now James I know you're in Norfolk but how are you I'm doing well uh, and, and it's just as well you say I am in Norfolk because otherwise the northern light behind me might give you the sense I'm somewhere a bit further a bit more exotic a bit further north but no that's just 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 the screen save you use on zoom when you're a mother and you really want to be out at night it's funny you say exotic and people always think further south and hotter you think north which is quite interesting I think exotic is sort of anywhere where you're not at that precise moment so it's, it's sort of x the, the ex bit means you're taken out of your current place and plonked somewhere else so i, I mean that said i can regard north norfolk as exotic because it's not knowledge <laughs> well that's true that's true now we go back sometime uh, may i actually say um zoomers that james was one of the very first people to reach out and help me when i first set up the urban bird i don't you i don't know if you remember all this but maybe 15 years ago i can't remember how long ago it was when i first had my website i couldn't i didn't have a camera i couldn't take pictures and you very kindly gave me some of your pictures uh, in order for me to adorn my website and some of those may still up, be up there now but i want to publicly thank you in front of all the zoomers and everyone else in the future watching this thank you very much james for for making me look good Certainly an absolute pleasure. I think there were photos of Buenos Aires. I was living in Ireland right. at the time. And you wanted someone to write something for your, to hijack, you said, your, your new website um, and write about the birds of another urban area, uh, in that case, Buenos Aires. I think I actually got a friend to do it, um, but I provided the photographs. It was, a, it was a great way to get in contact with you. Well, thank you very much for that. And, you know, I can't remember the very first moment we met each other, but we've seen each other a lot, uh, predominantly at bird fair. But for those who don't know you, what do you do? How did you do it? And where did you come from? In, re in reverse order, please. <laughs> I'm not even sure I can, I can wear that out. So um, grew up in Devon uh, and I was apparently a naturalist by the age of three or four when I pointed out a buzzard to my daddy and said, what's that? And he said, it's a crow. And I said, it's not a crow, daddy. I know what a crow looks like. So daddy bought a bird book and I've been a naturalist ever since. Can I just stop you there? It's been a big fashion recently of people saying that they've been involved in nature from a very early age. You know, yep. some people range it from, from the first few days of life to about, you know, early teens. But I think you fit into the sort of earlier category. Yeah, I mean, all I remember is always being interested in nature. By the age of seven, certainly, I was setting up a school bird club and persuading everyone to do our bespoke topic on their favourite bird. And somewhere I've still got the little kind of book that I made of, of my favourite birds in the end of it, as it was. So I can't remember a time when I wasn't into birds. And then all the other wildlife has sort of come subsequently in dribs and drabs, with moths pretty much the most recent acquisition, if you like. I was very much anti-moths for many years, slagging them off as being boring and brown, but I'm sure we'll talk about that in a bit. Now, you uh, let's talk about moths. Let's just go straight into this. Um, you've written this book, which I'll show everyone again, much to do about mothing. A very interesting title. I know you may have been influenced by a certain Mr. Shakespeare, but how long have you had that title in your head? Um, since I pitched the book, which was three years ago, and uh, I had, I did actually have a number of titles in my book. One was H is for Hawk Moth 2. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 um, the, the lawyers at Bloomsbury, the publisher, took offence to that and said we'd be sued by Helen MacDonald. Uh, and so I put together a handful of other titles, um, of which this one was one of my favourites. 
but I didn't expect it to be the one that the entire of the, the publishing committees, the editorial and marketing committee leapt on. So that has to be that title. So I admit for the first six months or so when I was researching the book and I knew that was the title, I kept very quiet about it because I thought it was a bit corny, but I have to confess, I've come to like it and the amount of positive feedback there's been on social media and from friends and stuff about, oh, I love your title, that's great, um, suggests it's probably the right one. So hopefully- yeah. It's a fantastic wordplay, and I, I, and I think it also sticks in your head, doesn't it? So, and I'm a great one. I love wordplays. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a really, very interesting title. Now, moths themselves. Um, my, I mean, I love nature, but I've, I've been damaged, James. I want to um, make a confession in front of the masses now. I've been damaged. I've been, I've been badly affected in my youth. I've been tampered with in many ways and mentally um, and I blame my dad and I blame Alfred Hitchcock um, <laughs> now my problem is that and what well, was maybe up until very recently I can't spare moths flying anywhere near me when I'm on the underground in London I feel like I'm a tree because any moth anywhere, anywhere in the carriage will fly to me and try and land on me. Um, and also, if I'm in an exotic place, I remember being in Peru once in, in a, a lodge in the Amazon with no door, basically. And every kind of moth you can imagine was fluttering into my room. And some of them were big things. And I, I felt nervous. And it was one of those situations where I had to force myself to, to hold a moth. In fact, I was a moth was thrusted at me to, to put on my finger. In fact, it was one behind me. That's not my finger, but that one did the rounds and a few people's fingers. And I was stand there, standing there with this moth on my finger, cold. I mean, the blood just left my body. I just I was just holding this moth. Because people have this impression that wildlife experts or whatever presenters, you know, can walk in anywhere and touch anything. I remember being on Spring Watch once and I had to touch a um a harvestman. And I said, is there any chance we can get a hand double in? <laughs> so can you tell me about your, because the thing is, my, I mean, as a kid, my dad used to kill them all the time whenever they came to the house. He called them um, bats because he came from Jamaica and they were, anything that flew in the night was a bat, regardless of what, whatever it really was. So I was brought up thinking they're not good. And also the fact that they flutter around and fly on, try and land on me, didn't help. So how did, you know, what was your, you said you didn't like them much before. Was it purely cosmetically or did you have an emotional uh, damage like, like I did? No, I mean, the, the kind of emotional damage you, out, you outlined is actually quite common. People don't like things they can't control and are erratic, and particularly when they sort of, uh, come into our personal space. So it's quite common that people don't like moths flying at them. I never had that. I was just really annoyed that they ate my suits. You know, you spend a couple of hundred quid on a suit, you expect it to last and not be eaten by moths. Just a couple of hundred quid? Well, that's all I could have thought. A poor civil servant of the world, you know. Whatever, whatever Top Shop had to offer. Listen, I, I, I have suits from 25 years ago. Shame I can't still wear them, but I, you know, they're bloody expensive, aren't they? Well, I'm wearing a suit jacket now, can't you see? Isn't that <laughs> that's some push? Um, so, uh, so that was the first point. The, the second point um, was that I thought all moths were small and brown and boring. And none of my friends who, who were mothers could, you know, dissuade me from that. Um, uh, it was a pure prejudice. I just thought they were all boring, all brown. What's the point in looking at them? And some of them had these really long Latin names. I mean, what's the point in Latin names? You've got English. Let's just use English names. So the whole, you know, the whole thing, there was nothing there. There was nothing to entice me. And I think I once said, you know, at what point in my evolution as a naturalist do I have to resort to moths in order to be able to get my kicks? I was really anti-moth, really anti-moth. And then, and then there was a moth that changed my life. Should I tell you about that? That was my next question. What was your spark moth, as my American okay. friends may ask? We're, we're on the same wavelength. So, yeah, so uh, I was going to go and twitch an orchid because I do stuff that doesn't move as well as stuff that does move. Um, and a friend who was coming on the twitch got the train up from his house uh, and he brought along a poplar hawk moth. 
Now, a popular hawk moth, I mean, I'd heard of hawk moths, but I thought they were sort of mythical. But this was one he caught in his garden the previous night. And I was like, wow, uh, that's quite cool. And it was really large and it was incredibly angular and it was sweetly furry and it was silvery with bronze bits all over it. And it was absolutely gorgeous. And I suddenly realised that not all moths ate clothes. Not all moths were small, brown and, be uh, and boring. And not all moths had just a scientific name. This was one that I could relate to. And she just sat there and just allowed herself on my finger to be admired, a bit like the hawk moth behind you. And completely, um, it, this, this single encounter, you know, changed my, the way I engage with nature. So it's not just about, you know, the fact that I turned to moths, but, but that moths became so important in how I engage with nature. And I realized the kind of the potency of even a quite ordinary suburban garden where my friend had caught a moth and where eventually I started catching moths too. So yes, it was a single encounter that, that changed my life. So most people, if I enough, how do you know it was a girl, by the way? Oh, she, she had, she had, yeah. Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but she was, she was full with eggs. She was, she had quite a large- um, Oh, she was pregnant. Or, yeah, she was pregnant. She had lots. Of, she, she she had a big abdomen, so you could tell it was a girl. Okay, so um, <laughs> so the question I want to ask you is this: What constitutes a moth? Because people think of moths as fat, you know, flying around at night. You don't see them during the day. Um, not as beautiful as butterflies. But is there? <laughs> it... <laughs> oh, scandal! Scandal! <laughs> But is there, is there a definitive way of telling a moth from a butterfly for those uninitiated? It's actually the opposite. We in English differentiate between moth and butterfly, but linguistically we're an outlier. So in French there's papillon and papillon de nuit, uh, butterflies and night butterflies. And it's the same in Dutch and it's the same in German. So all they differentiate is between night and day butterflies. So actually, the, the question is, is not how do you, you know, how do you tell them apart, but, but they're the same thing. Evolutionarily, they're basically identical. So that there's a wonderful sort of um, taxonomic chart that actually I see Claire Boys is on the on the line. It was her, her son, Doug, who showed me it. Uh, and it shows you sort of the evolutionary chart of butterflies and moths. And they're all within the order of Lepidoptera. So just as a swallow is a bird and a robin is a bird. So a moth and a butterfly are both Lepidoptera. Uh, and the butterflies are sort of nestled within moths taxonomically, evolutionarily. So butterflies, there's six families of butterflies, there's 120 families of moths, but they're the same thing. And pretty much every sort of um, so-called differentiator, so um, butterflies, only butterflies have clubbed antennae, for example, uh, every every so-called differentiator breaks down under scrutiny. So burnet moths, which are day flying things that look just like butterflies, they have clubbed antennae too. Okay, most moths are a bit hairier, but plenty of butterflies are hairier and no doubt the moths are hairier because most of them fly at night. And most is quite an important point because um, although we think of moths as you know exclusively creatures of the night, there are four times, roughly four times as many species of day flying moth in Britain as there are butterfly. So roughly 250 species of day flying moth, roughly 60 species of butterfly. So, you know, for us to say they're, they're you know, they're all nighttime creatures is wrong. And as for colour, I'll show you a pink elephant hawk moth and you tell me that's not as colourful as any butterfly you've got in Britain. <laughs> it's funny because I was in uh, Colombia a couple of years ago and um, I, I saw this butterfly it was like a brown swallowtail, brown, and it was quite small. I mean, it wasn't huge, it was like an inch long. And the, uh, the biologist with me said, oh, that butterfly is actually one of the kind of, one of the branches that actually went into a moth. So it's a bit of a, a hybrid, which I found really fascinating. And I think it, you know, it shows your point that there isn't that much of a difference. Yeah, there's a, a few years ago, I wrote a book called The Butterfly Pavilion. And it was all based on 18th century artworks. And I just crafted the text around it. And one of the artworks they wanted me to write about, you know, they didn't tell me what these species were. They just showed me it, showed me the picture and said, right, go away, work out what that, that butterfly is and write about it. And I went, it was gloriously colourful. It looked like a swallowtail. It had all these different, all these different colours on it. And eventually I worked out it was a Madagascan sunset moth. It was a moth 
moth and look like a butterfly. And that just proved to me that, you know, butterflies and moths, they're basically the same. So I went back to the publisher and said, do you mind if I keep this moth in? And I said, oh, no, 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 no. If it's a moth, it's not a butterfly. So we can't possibly have it in. It's oh, for goodness sake. I could write a whole piece about how this moth looks like a butterfly. And that makes you kind of question what the difference is. But no, they, they weren't brave enough. They weren't brave enough, David. They were probably affected like you were, you know, by, yeah, emotionally. by the childhood incident. But in terms of size, funny enough, it's, it's, it's a moth bigger than, I mean, like the Atlas moth, is that bigger than any butterfly? Or is, what's the biggest out of the, of, of, of the family? Uh, biggest that butterfly, question. probably one of the, one of the bird wings from Southeast Asia, something like Rajar Brooks bird wing, um, and how that compares in size to an Atlas moth or, a, or a, say a white witch from the near tropics. I don't know. I mean, they're all huge things. They're all, you know, the size of two hands put together. Each wing is, is a hand, so they're, they're big creatures. But then you've got you know tiny little specks of life, which are just three millimeters long as an adult, which uh, are, are micro moths, and, and uh, probably best ignored for, for the first few years of one's mothing experience, but not something to, to ignore entirely because they're fantastic creatures in their own right. Yeah, it's the big ones that I had troubles with, especially in tropical areas when they flew into your room. Uh, you know, you couldn't help but scream sometimes. Now, in terms of moths, um, one of my favourite moths, um, even though I've never seen one, is the wormwood pug. I actually, I, I don't have many pictures of wildlife in my in my apartment. A couple of ring oozles, uh, and that's it. But I also have a, a picture, a photograph of a moth, and it's a wormwood pug. And for those zoomers, I'm sure um, James will tell you what it looks like because it's really exciting looking, isn't it, James? It might be one of those small brown moths that I didn't bother looking at. You're right. <laughs> it totally is. But because it's named after, even though probably not, my local patch in West London, Wormwood Scrubs, then that's one of the reasons why I like it. Wormwood Pug. <laughs> um, let uh, me just ask... Each, each to their own. Uh, I, I don't even know if I've seen a Wormwood Pug. Pugs are... Um, pugs really are the little brown jobs of the moth world. So... Um, I've got a friend who's a very experienced mother. He's really, really good. He's found several species new to Norfolk. And I asked him how he goes about identifying pugs. He said, and he's from London. He's a cotton, proper cotton. He says, it's easy. I just bloody well sneeze on them and they go away. So he doesn't even bother to try and identify them. Now, a purist will say, no, of course you can do it with X, Y, and Z. And actually, a lot can be done. But they're an acquired taste. Some are very beautiful, many aren't. So your wormwood pug, you can keep your wormwood pug. I'll, I'll, I'll stick with something else. I think I like the one in your chest, actually. Well, yeah, I, can you see that? That's a death's head hawk moth. Yeah, can you, you need to stand up a little bit, show, you, show your oh, lovely torso really? off. Yeah, oh, that's it, that's it. I feel like Superman. <laughs> oh yeah, so that's, that's a death head hawk moth, a t-shirt made by a friend in honor of my um, my year. So I took her husband, I, I stole her husband on one of the first long distance trips and we didn't really know each other, but we had such a great time that um, uh, uh, it prompted his wife to start making t-shirts of moths. And every time they made a t-shirt to sell, they gave me one free, so it's fantastic. Brilliant. <laughs> Before we talk about your journey in the book, let's just get back to the basics. Um, I'm, someone who watches, watches, someone who likes moths is a mother. I take it. So for those uninitiated in the world of mothing, what is a mother? What do you do as a mother? Yeah, good question. Well, you can do anything from as simple as go for a walk in the countryside and look for moths just as you look for butterflies because there are day flying ones. Um, but most people associate moths with night and indeed, you know, 90% of moths fly at night. So what you do as a moth, uh, uh, several techniques. Um, uh, the most uh, famous one, if you like, is to harness um, moth's bizarre um, addiction to light. And so you stick up some form of bright light uh, and some form of contraption uh, and the moths get attracted to the light and then fall into the contraption in a bit of a daze. Uh, and inside this contraption, which is no more than a, you know, a tub, basically, you put some little egg trays and they basically, they're the beds for the moths for the, for the night. So they get to kind of stay all comfortable until morning. And then come morning, you get up very lazily, you go out with your cup of coffee and you, you see what the night has brought you. 
or you can do really hardcore and stay up all night long, which is, I guess, you know, what, what I did mainly in 2019. There's plenty of easy stuff as well. And plus, in your book, you, you talked about just leaving your kitchen light on and the window open. I mean, there's so basically because moths love light um, for whatever reason, perhaps they think it's a fallen moon or something. Any form of light, particularly in a dark place, is really good. So I'd I got a couple of friends, and I mentioned them in the book, were who um, didn't have a garden, so they, they thought they couldn't do mothing. But all they did was put a moth trap inside their bedroom and open the windows at, at night and keep them open up until they went to bed. So their entire bedroom, <laughs> you'd, you'd have hated it, David. The entire bedroom was full of these moths flying around or sitting around. And then come by the time they want to go to sleep, they just turn off the light and release the moths. So you can sort of do it anywhere. So kitchen light, bathroom lights. I had an Israeli friend, lived in Norwich for a number of years, who um, Yerav, and he was always um, sending me photos of whatever had been attracted to his bathroom light when he left the window open. Um, another really cool thing to do, another really good, cool technique is what they call sugaring or treacling. And that's fantastic because basically the, the moths get a free meal. And um, the free meal is both high in sugar and high in alcohol. So you um, dissolve brown sugar and molasses and treacle in beer or red, a bit of red wine and a dash of rum. And it smells heavenly and it tastes even better. And then you put it onto rolled ropes or you put it onto a fence post or something like that. And it'll stay there for a night or two and then come the moths and have a good little feed. Some of them fall over a little bit tipsy. Um, but otherwise they're absolutely fine uh, and then the rain washes it off the next day so that's also quite a cool little thing you can do pretty much anywhere. So I suppose when you say the rain washes off the next day you're talking about England? Obviously uh, with you in Spain it's probably a bit, <laughs> a bit less rain going around. And mothing is something you can do all year round I mean I was surprised actually when I found that you can actually go mothing on a freeze, frozen night in December. Yeah it's um, I mean you can't do that with butterflies, can you? I mean, you might come across the old you know, odd peacock or red admiral roosting or something like that, hibernating. But you can actually go mothing on, on cold nights because there's moths throughout the year. And there's a really good, great story uh, in a different book uh, by a guy called Roy Leverton. And his book's called Enjoying Moths, and it's cracking. And he, and he recalls um, finding a, a particular moth, a winter flying moth called a pale brindle beauty that had somehow fallen into a little puddle. And the puddle had frozen so that his moth was encased in ice. So he chipped it out and then he thawed it out and come uh, dusk the moth <laughs> flew off completely you know oblivious you know, none the worse for his experience and that's because it's got antifreeze inside its blood. So that's its strategy for surviving winter. It, it could survive being frozen and it's doing a pretty good job you have to say. Do you think that moffing is a British thing? What's this? What's the kind of world moffing like? Because I know in Spain, uh, apparently you need a license to be right. moffing, which I find incredible because it's okay to shoot birds and shoot uh, rabbits and stuff, but they say, oh, it's for the protection of the moths. Yeah, I mean, I was aware of that in Spain and it is, I mean, it does seem overly cautious, I have to say. So in Britain, there are an, uh, a suite of eight moths that are strictly protected that you can't um, trap or go and even go and look for, even, you know, potentially disturb their habitat without a license. So that they're, they're legally protected, but everything else is, is absolutely fine to go for. And then it comes down to, you know, making sure that you release it unharmed, etc. Um, so the difference between Spain and, and the UK is quite considerable. I think that's probably impeding the take up of, of mothing in such countries. As for whether it's particularly a British thing, I mean, I, I don't think so. But what is clear is that in the UK, there are more people doing it than anywhere else. And we know a lot more about moths than anywhere else. So butterfly conservation, every uh, three to five years or so produces a report, which is a pretty comprehensive status update of all the larger moths in Britain. Uh, and it, you know, it's quite clear that with 25 million records of moths, mainly from amateurs like, like myself and Maya uh, and um, Doug Boys, um, uh, that uh, you, know, you, you know a lot more, that we know a lot more about moths in Britain than we do in, anywhere else. And just one more question. When you were, I mean, there's gonna be loads more questions, but in, on this particular vein, when you were in Argentina, I mean, I, I presume because by the way, Zoom is James spent a lot of time in Argentina. 
So when you were there, did you notice moths then? Do you know, um, I did in as much as there were these annoying things that flew around and bumped into us. Um, but I, I don't remember, I never took a photo of a moth. I wasn't into mothing then. It's a real shame because if I had been, I mean, think what I could have discovered. At the time I went out to, to, to Argentina, there were um, two field guides to butterflies in um, Argentina, but both of us very small area, so in the northeast of Argentina and around the capital. And that was it. There was no national field guide to butterflies. So there was absolutely nothing about moths at all. So I'd have been starting from, you know, a kind of blank sheet of paper almost. That would have been really exciting, even more exciting than going birding. So I sort of regret that, but you can't really turn back the clock unfortunately absolutely not <clears throat> so you've written this book much to do about morphing and essentially without giving away the plot you are looking for you decide i mean how many firstly how many species of moths are there in the uk yeah there's there's two and a half thousand it's quite a lot so that compares to what i don't know um how many species of birds? 650 that might have been seen in Britain once or more? Yeah, six, yeah 620, something like that, yeah. Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a lot more lot more moths than birds. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to go for. So whereas, you know, people like uh, Patrick Barkham, who wrote the book The Butterfly Isles, when he went on a, a quest to see all Britain's butterflies, I couldn't have done that with moths. You know, it would take me several lifetimes to see all the moths in Britain, and we're getting new ones every year, so it would have been impossible. So I had to come up with some kind of short list of ones to aim for. Um, I think I chose about 120 targets, if you like, and these were moths that were either rare or remarkable in some way. These were moths with stories, stories I wanted to tell. Yeah, because they were ones that, you, as you said in your book, uh, were non-garden moths, um, because in your book, you did talk about, um, right at the very beginning, about um, one of the times you caught, was it like 2,000 odd moths yeah. overnight Yeah. in your garden? Yeah, so there's two and a half thousand moths, uh, individual moths in a single trap, but about 2,250 of them were the same species because they'd obviously had a mass emergence the previous night from our local horse, horse chestnut tree. Um, and they were horse chestnut leaf minor moths, which are very small, very pretty, um, but they basically live on, uh, the caterpillars live on horse chestnut leaves. Uh, and if you've got a tree, uh, the, the day that they all wake up, they wake up, a bit like the cicadas in the US, they all wake up simultaneously, uh, all emerge simultaneously as adults, and then uh, come into the nearest light source, which was my trap. So I had a two and a half thousand nearly of these uh, tiny little orange and silver things dotted all over my x-rays. I'd never seen one before. It was quite exciting <laughs> to go from zero to two and a half thousand in a single swoop. That's fantastic. So how did you plan your sort of voyage around the UK looking for these particular moths? Was it done regionally or was some of it down to luck or did you have sites pinned down? So it was, I mean, it was a, a huge logistical challenge. So, I mean, number one, the first question is which moths, moths to focus on? So I had to research which had stories to tell. There might be conservation stories, there might be stories of camouflage. There had to be something interesting about it. So there had to be, there had to be a tale to tell. And then it was a case of working out um, when in the year they flew and where, and then putting all that in a really complicated table and trying to work out what trips I could do to, to get all these different stories. Um, and it was, uh, as soon as you've done that, you, you know, you, you know, okay, Kentish glory. It doesn't live in Kent anymore. It only lives in the Scottish Highlands. Yeah, okay, but where in the Scottish Highlands? And when does it fly? Okay, so we find out where in the Scottish Highlands. And I, and I talked to a number of people and, and it's been almost, you know, almost an entire week talking to people, planning the trip and scheduling it for the precise week when there's most likely to be the greatest chance of seeing Kentish glory and then a month beforehand, there's a massive heat wave in Scotland and everything gets advanced by about three weeks. And we suddenly learn that the Kentish glory that we plan to see in early May is already flying in early April. And we've got to do something about it quickly, otherwise we're going to miss it. So it was a huge logistical challenge, but, um, you know, really quite rewarding. I think of all the moths we tried for, there was only one failure um, out of 120. So that's not, not, a bad, not a bad hit rate. Yeah. I mean, don't tell us your best story, because that's 
preserved for people to buy the book and read about. But tell us your fifth best story. <laughs> the fifth best story. Crikey. OK, so um, there's a moth called the Clifton Nonpareil. And the Clifton Nonpareil non means unparalleled. And Clifton is a sort of a bastardization of Cliveden, which was the place it was first found in England. And this is arguably Britain's largest moth that, you know, it could be uh, with its wings open from one wingtip to the other, sort of 12 centimetres long. And it's, a, it's a huge thing. It loves treacle. It loves this, this sugary solution. And it's got these bright blue stripes on the hind wings. So its other name is called blue underwing. Uh, so it's a really beautiful moth, and it's a moth that was mythical for, for, for ages. And it was really highly prized by the Victorian collectors who only ever encountered it as vagrants. Um, it bred in England uh, in, between the 1930s and 1960s, then went extinct. And gradually, since the year 2000, it's been recolonizing. And in 2018, which was the year before I did this, this big thing, uh, it, there was a hint that it might be recolonizing properly and things might be coming in place. Anyway, I was really keen to, to see um, uh, a Clifton nonpareil and actually keen to kind of find my own Clifton nonpareil. Um, and during the, the summer, I, I got a, a message from a, a friend, just a photo. And it was just a photo of a Clifton nonpareil that he found at um, Brockenhurst train station in the New Forest by day. He said it was sitting under a light on platform three. And I thought, how, I mean, how rude that he could just like go and catch a train to go to work or something and just see one of these things. Anyway, I thought, well, I, you know, okay, lucky, lucky so-and-so. But about two weeks later, we were driving through the New Forest en route to do um, some survey work, some moth survey work in, in Dorset. And Brockenhurst was only about, I don't know, 10 miles off route. And I said to my friend, Will, who was my wingman for the entire year, I said, should we just go and have a look at Brockenhurst train station? I mean, obviously it won't be there because of other thing like that. You're waiting there, there's not a chance, but let's go and have a look. So we got to Brockenhurst train station and, uh, and what should we do? Well, where did he have it? He had it on platform three under the light. Why don't we start on platform three? I mean, there's no point really being here. But I mean, let's, you know, let's go and have a look. We went down to platform three uh, and on platform three under the light, exactly the same light and exactly the same platform, was a different non Clifton non pari. So its markings showed it wasn't the same individual my friend had had two weeks earlier, but it was in exactly the same place. We couldn't believe it. I mean, that's remarkable. What's going on there? That's a great story. Oh, but it's only the fifth best story. Yes, I mean, you have to uh, get the book to, uh, to find out the better ones and the ones that aren't so exciting, but I'm sure, I'm sure they'll be up there somewhere. Um, your daughter also played a, a big part in this, Maya. Um, Maya, I guess, uh, has been sort of uh, mentored by yourself when it comes to moths, would I believe? Would I be right in saying that? Yeah, or well, vice versa. Or is it a natural sort of thing she's got for moths? Um, she she's sort of grown up with moths. So um, when I started mothing, she was uh, two or three years old. So there have always been moths around the garden and the house. And for her sixth birthday party, we did half Star Wars and half sort of a moth show and tell. And moths make a, an appearance at, at all her birthday parties when they're at home. Um, so she's I mean, she's a bit of a moth star. She she yeah she loves them. You know, elephant hawk moth, the bright pink one, is clearly going to be her favourite. Um, but she's she's pretty good, you know. Uh, sometimes she puts me right on my identification too, so I, I learn learn from her. She's the master. That's good. But what's this, what's what's the situation for moths? Because when you think about moths in a general scheme of things, they are kind of underrated. You know, people don't really think about moths other than eating your clothes. Yeah. What is the situation? I mean, I understand that moths in general are declining, aren't they? Yeah. Certainly so in the UK. Yes, that's absolutely right. There's a, a really important report published by Butterfly Conservation a couple of months ago, and it painted really quite a complex picture of what's going on with British moths. But one of the headlines was there are one third fl fewer moths flying in Britain today than there were 50 years ago. And that that matters because moths matter uh, and moths matter because they do amazing things as pollinators. Um, so we think of bees as pollinating the, the flowers and the agricultural crops in the countryside, but actually moths take over once it comes to dusk. Uh, 
So um, I think there's been three studies of, of moths in agricultural landscapes and trying to work out how important they are for transporting pollen about the place and thus uh, as a proxy for pollination. And they found that near up to 45% of moths in agricultural areas are carrying pollen around the place. So they're really, really important creatures. They're also, you know, they're vital for the food chain. So we'd have far fewer bats and far fewer cuckoos, for example, and other birds if there weren't as many moths around. So one estimate is that um, blue tits, a common, common garden bird I'm sure many of us are familiar with, eat 35 billion moth caterpillars each year. So we'd have a lot fewer blue tits in our gardens if there weren't as many moths around, as indeed there aren't. And what about climate change? Has that been sort of affecting the distributions? It must be. Yeah, so, so climate change has a, has, is quite a complicated set of uh, implications it has. Uh, on the bad side, it's um, pushing species that are basically are at the northern or high altitude end of their, their distribution in the UK. It's leaving them with nowhere to go. They can't go any further north and they can't go any further uphill. So the thinking is that um, the, in particular northern moths are likely to be suffering from climate change. But those in the south and uh, moths that are spreading from the continent into the UK are definitely benefiting. Um, I think there's also a sense that it might be the generalists that are doing, doing better than the specialists uh, in terms of climate change. So it's, it's a pretty mixed picture. Uh, and you would say ostensibly it's good because we're gaining more species than we're losing, but we're probably losing the rarer species. And that from a conservation perspective is a very worrying thing. And in terms of their actual movements, I mean, are most of these moths resident are, or are in Britain anyway, or, are, or do we get migrants coming through on a regular basis? Yeah, it's a good question. So, so the very large majority are, are um, exclusively resident, residents. Um, uh, a fairly large minority of both residents and migrants and moth migration it's a, it's a quite remarkable thing you know it's amazing enough that a swallow can come up from from Africa to spend the summer here but for a tiny moth that's just seven millimeters long to fly all the way from the Baltic states as the diamondback moth regularly does is, is amazing um, and it also means that um, sort of just as bird watchers like migration, migration, the change of the seasons. So mothers look out for conditions that are sort of suitable for, for immigration of moths. Um, and that means that uh, um, it just makes for really, really exciting mothing because you never know what you're going to, going to attract when you head down to Dungeness in Kent or Portland Bill, places you know, or British bird watchers will know from a birding perspective are equally good for, for moths. And the moths of those places are as, as well studied, if not better studied, than the birds are. What is it about moths then for you? I mean, you mentioned you touched on the idea of not ex not knowing what to expect, but is that the main thing? So there's there's so many things. One is you can never be bored because there's a there's an infinite variety of moths. They they literally do go on forever because there's always new species being added. Second is that they're so surprising and so fascinating. So there's one moth, the scarce silver lines, that actually sings. You know, we can't hear it, but it sings from the top of oak trees. There's another moth whose adult is capable of swimming underwater. It's called the sandhill rust. Um, there are moths with mouth parts, so they, they, they don't have a proboscis, they don't have a tongue, but they, they, they feed by nibbling. And they were around basically you know, before the dinosaurs were. And are, they the, are they the close moths? No, those are the, uh, caterpillars. So the, the caterpillars are the ones that eat there. But these are actually the adult moths that have mandibles. So it's quite remarkable. Tiny little things, wonderful creatures. So they're so, you know, so fascinating. And it's sort of the deeper you delve, the more you more stories you kind of you, you kind of learn and the more you go, wow, that's amazing. But there's another thing, too, which is and although we know more about moths in Britain than anywhere in any other country in the world, as the 25 million records collated by butterfly conservation shows, we still don't know enough. So, and we're still learning. So, and everyone, every amateur has the chance of contributing something really quite new and valuable. So in my second season of, of mothing uh, in my new Norwich home, um, I caught a moth that was entirely new for the county. So never been seen in the county before, a vagrant. Um, the same autumn, I was wandering around on the North Norfolk coast bird watching and bumped into a Mediterranean species that had never been seen in Norfolk before, but a lovely moth called the Crimson Speckled. 
Um, and even kind of, you know, at then at that point, I knew nothing about moths. Um, so even complete rank amateurs can make these new discoveries. You, you try getting a new moth for Extremadura in your garden or on your balcony or something like that. Now, I know you look up, but you're not going to... It probably funny, funny you should say that because I knew, you know, a lot of people think that all I do is look at birds. And okay, most of the time I do. But I've got something to share with you. I have been taking pictures of moths. Would you, you have Yes, I have. You're I a like, moth, David. I'd like to show you, this is, this is my desktop. I'd like to show you some pictures. You've obviously seen that one before. But I just want to take you through my, my little, can everyone see this by the way? I hope you can all see this as a full screen. It's well, not actually, a full but, screen yet. No, it's just, a, we, we just got your um, sort of, your list of files. Oh, really? Yeah. How's that? No. What, what can you see? All I'm seeing is, is something which says airdrop recents and desktop on the left hand side, a list of files in one column. Okay, let me try again. This is all totally unrehearsed by everyone, by the way, so that's probably why it's like this. How's that? Aha, uh -huh, we've got it. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Good. So, um, oh, that's the only one I've got. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, that didn't work. Okay. Uh, let me just try one more thing. Can you see my, can you see this now? No, it's doing the same thing as before. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's bloody good, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> we move swiftly on. <laughs> I wanted to see your moth photos. You're just pretending that they're moth photos. They're not oh, really moths. They're birds, aren't they, David? I was hoping that I would have accidentally taken a picture of something that was the first, not only for Britain, maybe the first for the world. Well, it's not impossible. Um, so there is, a, a, in fact, you're more likely to have found that back in London. So there is a species in London that was new for the world. And that was one of the, one of the little micromoths that I set out to try and find on my on my uh, on my peregrinations so this was praise peregrina which is why i call use the word posh word peregrinations and it was um nobody knew what it was they kept on catching it in gardens in london and eventually they worked out that it was a uh, worked out what genus it was uh, and the genus was from sort of the indian subcontinent uh, but they realized it wasn't like any known species it was a new species uh, for science but clearly an interloper, one that had come in with plants or something like that, imported from the Indian subcontinent, because it wasn't, you know, the genus wasn't native to Britain. But it was in London. There you go. So you could have done it. it wormwood scrubs, it could have been the wormwood something or another. You could the have wormwood, found not pug, m moth. That's right, something like that. <laughs> I mean, is there a lot of uh, moth action in urban areas? One of the most surprising and really quite pleasing things about moths is how accessible they are. So um, if, you know, particularly during COVID, during lockdown um, last year, there was an enormous, there was a sort of surge in interest in moths because now we can get out of their home. And the joyous thing about moths is if you run a, a light or something like that, a, a moth trap, they come to you. So you don't need to do anything and you can see loads of species in your garden. And when, when I mean loads, um, so I was astonished in my first two or three months of mothing to have 200 species in my London garden. And it was a bog standard little terraced garden. And now after five years in Norwich, we've just passed 700 species of moth in our garden. And again, it's not a particularly, you know, it's a small garden, it's in a suburban housing estate, it's nothing special about it. But there's loads of these things sort of living their lives unseen by us. Uh, and just dying to be discovered. Um, and 700 is not even a particularly long garden list. There are people I know who've seen well over a thousand species of moths in their garden. And that just, you know, that, that, uh, I find that, you know, really hard to compute. So yes, urban areas may not be the best, but that you do get a good diversity. People have a stereotypical view of what a bird looks like. Obviously they got it wrong with me, but generally they've got a stereotypical view. What does a, an average moth look like? Do you know, um, some people would say that birders have taken over mothing in the last decade. How uh, dare they? Well, uh, but I guess I'm sort of testament to that. You know, I was originally a birder and then kind of matured into uh, wider things. Uh, but fundamentally, I probably am still a birder. Uh, I'll probably go out birding this weekend, for example. Um, so birders and mothers probably don't look very different. Um, but what I would say is that um, 
you, I don't know. Moths are so much more um, accessible to uh, than than birds tend to be, uh, in as much as you know you can see them at home and they sit around right in front of you rather than flying away. Uh, and even as as your, your slide shows behind you, you can have them perched on your, on your finger. That they're really really good for introducing kids to nature too. So you know my daughter's you know, pays evidence to that, um, but. You know, they're so accessible, they're so wonderful, they're great. That's the so, that. that means that people look different if they look at moths than birds, I don't know. So you're walking down the street or walking down a country lane and you see to your right a Camberwell beauty and to your left you see a moth that you've never seen before. And are you torn or do you just go straight to the moth? You're really putting me on the spot there because um, I've never seen Camberwell Beauty. That's why I'm asking the question. I've done uh, my research, James. Uh, uh, you, know, you know, it's the big gap on my British moth list, on my British butterfly list. Um, yeah. yeah. So with one hand, I'm using the net to grab the moth. <laughs> with the other hand, I'm looking through the binoculars at the Camberwell Beauty. And with my third set of hands, which obviously we all have, I'm photographing both of them at the same time. I don't know, you can't, you can't ask those things of me, that's too difficult. Um, it depends which one was showing best, because I'm a photographer as well, so I'd probably do that. <laughs> Horrible question, you meanie, you meanie. Well, today's a very special day, uh, because it's the day that this book's launched. So congratulations, and uh, I'd love to raise my bottle of water to you as well. Um, so I hope you do very well with the book. Um, I've read through it and I must say, you know, very entertaining, classic James Lowen, because you've written several books. What advice would you give to somebody out there, a budding writer who wants to write an entertaining book that draws people in about a niche taxa? I mean, moths, if you don't mind me saying so, it's far more niche than birds, for example. So it means niche as far as I'm concerned. So at the moment, what, at the moment, yeah. What advice would you give someone who wants to write a book about a taxa that people don't really regard? So the first thing I'd say is to read another book. There's a book called The Fly Trap, and I've just forgotten the author. It's a Swedish author, but he makes hoverflies absolutely fascinating. And if you can do it with hoverflies, you can do it with anything. And he does it by um, making things really simple, really personal, um, weaving in stories about his himself and what his explorations of these or investigations of these hoverflies make him think about the world. And that's what, you know, in part, that's what nature is about. Nature makes us think differently about the world. So whatever tax you're into, if it, if it makes you think in a different way, try and communicate that. Uh, in a way that he does. Frederick something, Frederick Schierberg or something like that, I can't remember. Yeah. Cool. I've only got enough enough room for moths at the moment, it appears. While talking specifically about you, I mean, you've been very, you know, um, humble because uh, you've written a book that, you know, has got a lot of traction at the moment and it's about a subject which, you know, you're joining immediately by the title and it's a journey. And it's a journey that, as you say, opens up your mind to these really interesting insects and there's stories of different sorts for each one. So I just, I'm just trying to wonder how you approach that sort of thing. For me, it's a really unusual approach because I would expect a book that basically talked about, this is a whatever moth, this is a, you know, a burnet moth, you know, like a, a guide almost, but maybe I found this moth when I was walking through Norfolk and, and have stories regaling how beautiful that moth is. How do you how do you get people? How do you you know how do you do it? How do you actually sort of craft something that is not along those kind of lines that you'd expect? Yeah. So um, I wanted this book book to be not solely about moths. You know, but I don't. Although it's you know it is it is a book about moths. I don't see it as a book about moths. For me, it's a travel narrative. It's basically it's an exploration of Britain and British landscapes and British people seen through the filter of moths. So I'm using moths to get at different stories. So 
a lot of the book is divided into so different landscapes. So there's a chapter on heathland, there's a chapter on woodlands, there's a chapter on wetlands. And it's trying to understand you know, what's going on with wetlands in Britain, what's the conservation issues of it, and what's the moths part in that, and who's doing what to help those moths, um, and what, what do we learn from those moths. So it's thinking a little bit more thematically. It's not thinking in terms of a species. It's the species list, but the species are just the entry point to the kind of to, to the to the wider the wider issues going on uh, and the bigger story that's going on so i think whatever your tax uh, you know that your obscure tax the wood lice of, of britain or something it's not a book about wood lice it's a book about what are the wood lice telling you about the world the world in which we live and the world that you're exploring it's a very succinct and good answer i'd say absolutely what's next for you sir um well, I got another book out, I'm afraid, on moths in uh, August or September. And this is a, a slightly different book. This is, a, this is a field guide to common moths. And we've called it a gateway guide because it's a gateway both to the world of moths as an easy entry point, but also a gateway to the, the big posh guides that are out there. And Richard Lewington, who's on, on the on the Zoom on Zoom call, is the is the master of these guys. So, I should get on my knees now. Richard Lewington's here. I, yeah, he is. For, yeah. the, for the Zoomers that don't know Richard, he is the godfather when it comes to illustration of insects and other such invertebrates. I bow down to you, Richard. And good evening to you as well. It is indeed. So, so this book is sort of an entry book to Richard's books, uh, as well as an entry to the world of moths, because you know, as I went around the country, um, it was quite apparent that many people wanted to get into moths, but found it quite hard to start. And what I wanted to do with much about nothing was inspire them to start. And then now I want to kind of help them get into moths and then they will graduate um, uh, to Richard's books and everyone else's books. And then hopefully, you know, come to love moths, come to record moths, come to contribute to our knowledge of moths and expand that database of 25 million records that butterfly conservation has into 100 million records. And I think you know, we, also, we saw that already in last year. So the number of people submitting um, uh, records, observations of moths to the, the county moth recorder in Devon led by 75% compared to the previous year. And that's, you know, that's a combination of COVID changing how people engage with wildlife, making people focus locally, but also I think testament to the, to the increasing interest in these, these underexplored and not necessarily um, always loved insects. I think also you should get into therapy and hypnosis. Hey, eh? Yeah, you know, for people like me to sort of say, you will wake up and you will not be afraid of moths and you will be hugging the most you know, the biggest moth possible, you'd be giving it kisses and putting it on your shoulder. That would so, be a great, uh, great thing to do, I think. So it would. I mean, demystification is a way of doing it as well. I used to be terrified of snakes. And I spent um, three months as a 19 year old in the tropical forest, subtropical forest of Paraguay, and three months in the subtropical forest of Indonesia before I finally saw my first snake. And at that point, I realised there weren't anything to be scared by. They were gorgeous creatures. And now, now I'm, I, I'm addicted to adders. I call it my adderiction. And I spend, um, you know, numerous mornings each spring photographing adders um, at kind of point blank range. So, you know, the more that you can come in contact with moths that have just come out of moth trap and are sleepy, like the one on your on the finger behind behind you, uh, the more I think you, you won't need your hypnosis, David. You'll be a mother. You'll be a mother within a year, I reckon. Is there any taxa, any animal that frightens you? Humans. People. Uh, and some big spiders. <laughs> <laughs> James, what is your favourite moth? Um, crikey, there's so many. Um, I... There are two moths that come to our garden that light up my daughter's face like no other. I've mentioned one of them, which is the bright pink elephant hawk moth. And the other one is the emperor moth, which if ever you needed a moth to kind of knock the pants off any butterfly in Britain, it's that one. It's, it's like a peacock. It's got all the things that a peacock has got, but loads more in, uh, in addition. And I think it'd be a sort of, it'd be a runoff between those two. I could mention some, some micro moths as well, but they've all got Latin names and you'd tell me off, so I won't do that. And if you could be anywhere on this planet, notwithstanding the current pandemic, 
Where would you be right now? Oh, that's also a tricky question. Um, yeah, I, I, I do hanker after a bit of foreign travel. Um, three years ago, I wrote a book about uh, wildlife weekends in Europe, 52 European wildlife weekends. And the, recommend, the, the weekend it sort of recommends to go wildlife watching in, in late May is to, and actually you'll appreciate this, it's to Matera, the, the kind of ancient um, hilltop um, town in, in Italy. Um, and it recommends it because it's amazing architecture. Uh, there's less orchestrals nesting all over the all over the city. Uh, I'd like to sit outside with a, a double espresso, uh, a pizza, and less orchestrals flying around in the sun in Italy. If that's not too guilty a confession. That sounds great. Um, Zoom is just to let you know what's coming up. Um, on Monday we have this guy called Les, Les Stroud. Fascinating man. I had a chat with him um, this week, actually, from Canada. He's a survivalist, naturalist, and he will tell us how to survive bear attacks, you know, how to survive being swamped by lots of moths. Anything you want to ask, he can tell you how to survive it. So he's on, on Monday, um, the 31st of May. On Thursday, the 3rd of June, there's a guy called Tim Beatley, who I was very, very keen to get on uh, in conservation with. Tim. Um, to be honest, is someone who's not a household name, but he's talking about the work he does. Uh, he's written a book called Making Cities Bird Friendly. So he's going to be talking about architecture and, and how us humans can actually make our cities much better for wildlife. On Monday, the 7th of June, there's a gentleman called Charlie Corbett, who has written a book called 12 Birds to Save Your Life. So if you want your, if you want your life saved, Tune in then. On Thursday, the 10th of June, um, Dave Gandhi will be here. He's actually based in Bangkok. You know him, James, of course. Yeah, old friend of mine. <laughs> and uh, Dave will be talking about the birds of Bangkok. So that'd be a fascinating one. That's going to start at 4.30 in the afternoon on June the 10th because of the time difference. Um, we have a, a lady on May, sorry, June the 14th, Monday, June the 14th, Tessa Bose. Um, she's written a book which has now been reprinted under the name of Etta Lemon. And Etta Lemon was one of the ladies that created the RSPB. So we'll be talking about women in nature again. Um, and I know that I've just been talking about men up until now, but up until before then, actually, as if you're a regular Zoomer on in conservation with your know that there's been lots of women featured over the last few weeks. Um, and the final person so far on the run of people will be on Monday, the 28th of June, Joe Shute, who is a journalist writing for The Telegraph, and he's written a book called What Do You Know About the Weather? So some interesting subjects come, coming up. James, I'd like to thank you. I mean, you know, you're an old buddy, but thank you uh, for agreeing to, to be here and talk about books uh, and in particular this book about moths, your book, much to do, uh, much ado about mothing. Thank you very much for uh, for coming tonight. Congratulations, by the way, so you're, you know, launch day today. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. It was great fun, David. Great fun. Good. And Zoom is, as ever, it's fantastic to know you're here watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed it too. Look after yourselves and remember that golden rule. Keep looking up. But also look down as well because we've got the moths. <laughs> <laughs>